Welcome back to Nostalgia Cast. I'm Darren Lundberg. And I'm Johnny Craddock. And today we'll be looking at The Swan Princess from 1994, directed by Richard Rich, former uh, Disney director. Uh, we've talked about Don Bluth before. So it's... Not to be confused with The Black Swan. This is yeah. not The Black Swan. <laughs> not the same movie. The funny thing was, both of, both of us rented it on Amazon. And you know how they do like other choices? They had the sequels yeah. and then they had Black Swan right, yep. right there. I'm like, what? no, 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 no. Not that one. <laughs> you don't want to put that one on kids. But yeah, we'll be talking about that with Molly Raspberry. Um, again, a, a very, she's she's getting up there. She's a film grad right now. We've been chatting on Twitter. She's making a name for herself. So yeah, we, we did discover too, she's not a world famous actress. However, her name does sound like it. Molly yeah. Raspberry, world famous actress. So if she wants to head in that direction, she definitely could. She's got that kind of bag. Uh, personality and voice so it'd be great another career choice she could do if she wants to go back into schooling and do another grad study and that kind of thing but yeah, we'll be chatting with her about that but before we go ahead and talk about the swan princess we want to chat about our last episode from with another guest natasha albar of cultured vultures she's the editor there and a very very good writer uh, as well uh, i forgot to mention and i feel bad she's actually a rotten tomatoes approved critic Oh, really? Wow. So, and I, I feel bad for not bringing that up. That's definitely an accomplishment that should be brought up with people. But uh, yeah, so we chatted about the 1998 Parent Trap, the remake of the Haley Mills Disney classic. Uh, she obviously felt very strongly that she had some reservations about like, you know, the kids being too well-rounded or too grounded maybe and not throwing fits like normal kids would. But all in all, she enjoyed it. And it was definitely, um, and I think we got her to want to try the uh, original because I know she hadn't seen that before. Right. Um, how did you come down on the Parent Trap? Well, I kept wishing I was watching the original. And uh, I finally went and watched it, and I'm glad I did because I had a lot of fun. Um, I didn't have as much fun watching the Lindsay Lohan or Lindsay Luhan, whoever you want to pronounce it there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I thought it could have been a better movie, so it could have been remade. I don't think the direction was that great. I'm not a big Nancy Myers fan, and I'm not a big Lindsay Lohan fan. So it was, wasn't that fun of an experience for me to watch that one, but I really did enjoy watching the Haley Mills version and just. Um, just the nostalgia for that one for me was just off the charts. So, right. And then my point of view was just, it was fine. Like I thought it was worth remembering just because it's, it's a nineties Disney comedy it has all the quirks that the nineties Disney comedies had all the little musical, too much musical stuff. Uh, the, the comedy asides, things like that. I fit in with that. But again, talking about the original sixties version, it just, my first experience with that movie, it, it, it works and it transcends. And so being able to re remake that in a movie with Dennis Quaid and the, the late Natasha Richardson, and, and it works because the story worked back in the sixties and they didn't really change a lot of the fundamentals. So um, Parent Trap, that's uh, either version you go for, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find something to enjoy there. Uh, so yeah, so what we wanna do, let's go ahead and switch and talk about The Swan Princess uh, with okay. Molly Raspberry, uh, soon to be famous actress, Molly yep. Raspberry. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we, we're gonna love having her on and chatting with her about that. But before we do, let's go ahead and watch the trailer. All right. Go on, Derek. <laughs> As children, Prince Derek and Princess Odette weren't exactly the best of friends. But as they grew up, they began to see each other differently. Then, before their kingdoms could unite, Odette was stolen away by an evil enchanter. Odette is mine. Transforming her with a powerful spell. Wherever you are, I'm gonna find you. The Swan Princess. An exciting, delighting, magical, musical fantasy. Beauty and glamour and we a match. Princesses on parade. Featuring the voices of John Cleese. To the rescue, mademoiselle. Sandy Duncan. Queen coming through here. Excuse me, excuse me. Jack Palance. Don't give me that look, Missy. And Stephen Wright. Na, 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 na. Now, Odette the Swan and her faithful friends from the forest are searching for Prince Derek. True dolls. To reveal the swan's secret, a spell that can only be broken by looking beyond her feathers to find the beauty inside. Hello, Derek. Odette. Come share a timeless tale of legendary love. 
The Swan Princess, an enchanting animated adventure. Okay, The Swan Princess, 1994, directed by Richard Rich, starring, uh, well, the only ones that I really know are John Cleese and Stephen Wright, um, but we'll maybe chat about them a little more. Uh, Johnny, we wanted to welcome our next guest. We've got a film studies grad, um, former coordinator of the Athens Film Festival. She's a contributor to the film stage. Molly Raspberry, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing, oh, thank you. I'm doing well, and it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Good. Uh, as most of our guests that we've had a nostalgia cast, like uh, we've ch been chatting on, on Twitter for a bit. Um, you've got a lot of great, uh, you've got a great voice, you've got great opinions. And so I'm, it's, uh, I engage with that. And so we've, we've been chatting for a bit and trying to arrange something like this. I think I even came on and was like, if you ever want to be a guest in the nostalgia cast, we'd love to have you, love to have your voice and you're graciously, uh, graciously accepted the offer. So um, I'm glad we're able to chat about uh, the Swan Princess. Um, again, great conversations, like I said, the, how you came to my attention, again, we mentioned her a lot, but Rachel Reviews, she mm -hmm. does a panel called Female Film Critics Speak Out, where she gets a bunch of female film critics. I know she's had like Christy Lemire, she's had uh, Danielle, um, shoot, I can't remember her name. Um, Olsen. Olsen. Yeah, that's right, Solzman. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jen Johans, just, just a lot of really good, like major voices, um, just, just out on, on the Twitter sphere. And, it's, it's great listening to you talk about like your experiences and like how it is like being, again, a female, especially when you, it's weird, the attention you get when you're trying to review like superhero movies and like the ire yeah. that, that female film critics, uh -huh. just a very fascinating conversation. But again, like it's, it's your opinions and the way that you're able to just have your, your thoughts and you're very, I don't want to say like forceful in a bad way, but you're, you're able to voice those opinions in a way that gets my attention at least. So that's something that I um, but like, if you wanted to explain a little bit about yourself, I know I mentioned that you're a film studies grad. You're back in school now, right? Yes, I am. Um, you're doing. We we're trying to arrange something, and you're like, you ended school, and but now you're in the mid before you go into your practicum. Is that is that what it's yes. called? Yes, yes, it is my field experience. I'm doing master in library science and information studies, and I'm hoping to work either in the academic library or dream job a film archive, and that's where I want to work. Work. That's a dream job for me, but. But yeah, but if it happens, it's I would love both those, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds terrific. But it's it's that's a new word. Like I know Johnny and I intended college, but we didn't like get that far. You know, <laughs> far as going to a practicum and stuff like that. But if you um, again with the film stage and with the Athens Film Festival, if you wanted to explain like, um, and I know you talked about this with Rachel, but I'm just fascinated by it. As far as the graduate school thing goes, um, what does that entail going back into school? And why is that? I know you chatted about it being a big deal. What, what, is, what does that do for you? What does that mean? I think it's really, it's, it's reacclimating yourself to going to getting back into that research mode is a big part of that or working in film productions, which I did a little bit of that with the MFA students, and they got even more high tech stuff than I remember in undergrad, like they got the, they got 16 millimeter cameras, they've got, they got all the best digital red cameras, all that stuff on the grad level, grad oh. level, but it's research is a lot of that. And you're gonna, in fact, people, I, I actually retweeted this thing on Twitter that made me think about it. It's like, why do you keep dissecting these films? You're just ruining and ruining the fun. And, and with clenched teeth, you just say back, say back, this is me having fun. <laughs> so it's also that, but it's also a chance to actually find the art in things you wouldn't think would be artistic merit. I wrote actually one of my first grad school papers was on the new Ghostbusters, not the newest one, not Afterlife, but the one before with the all female cast. Yeah. That was, I actually still like that movie a little bit, even though it's still not as good as the first one. It's definitely much better than the second one. Yeah second one but i think it got way too over hated and it was starting that trend of more female action hero films and i also compared it to postmodernist nostalgia for with wonder woman and how it took from superman and then also looking at how ghostbusters changed to be in this new landscape where in the original it's very much it's a very reagan entertainment film yeah. people don't want to think about that but the guys are very sexist, like Bill Murray is trying to hook up with his student, everything like that, everything. And, and of course, 
course, um, Sigourney Weaver's art is completely ignored and she and she's just flirted with by Bill Murray because just like, oh, no, there's nothing haunting or anything like that, yeah. anything like that. And of course, the blowjob ghost scene with that, that infamous scene. And of course, bringing up, well, I have you worked in the private sector? And but then in the in the remake, it turns out that, oh, we'll help. We'll pay. The government will fund your projects and everything like that. And it's like this total shift in politics right there. Mm -hmm. And not just with also the girl, also the girls being the badasses and the himbo being the secretary and everything like that. Chris Hemsworth makes a great himbo. Let's be real here. <laughs> right. <laughs> he really does. So, yeah, that was stuff I really brought up and like how you can also take from that, which I probably should make a sequel for that for how Wonder Woman. 1984 took the bad stuff from 80s nostalgia and mm. just replayed it in a sense like including the racist caricatures of terrorists and that sort of thing like and that stuff and you're just like into course women just really lo love stones and jewels and you're just like oh no so yeah that, i was very disappointed when woman wonder woman 1984 came out because i loved the first wonder woman i thought patty jenkins did a terrific job and my paper was was also bringing that up and apparently my film professor liked that because he actually sent me sent me a um an email about how wonder woman actually boosts young girls self-esteem and i was like I guess he really did like my paper in a sense and just like my grad school professor liked my paper. It's just like, <laughs> it's those feelings you're like, oh, and getting to write about something new no one's talked about before was the big thing where you have come up with your own theories. And that was really cool. Yeah, yeah. that's a, I, I'm glad you vocalized that because uh, uh, that's something that watching Wonder Woman 1984 again, I don't, uh, I had not, not nearly as good as the first one. I liked that it was like oh, trying okay. to be ambitious. And that, that's what you talked about with Rachel. It's like, you don't just do like the hoity-toity highbrow movies. You don't just cover like the Eisenstein and the yeah. uh, Fellini stuff. Yeah. You're actually able to cover the yeah. entertainment and do something exactly. interesting with the toys. And, and I love that. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's how one of my best friends got a thesis about codename Kids Next Door and Fairly Odd Parents and brought it with Deleuze and Societies of Control. And that was stuff my professor had never watched. He was never going to watch, but he was like, you make it make sense and I will accept it. And it's now published. So, so yes, her name is Julia Staben. So if you, if you have access to access to an academic library, her thesis is up there so you can read all about it. It's a good pay. It's a good thesis. I really liked it. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, that, so that is, that explains like your grad uh, film study. What, I mean, why, why are you going back into it? Like you did it already, but now you're going back in? What was, why did you want to do that? I realized that I needed the, I needed the more of the experience to also do, do um, archive work and like library work and that stuff, because that was another thing I was very passionate about. And I also noticed it was actually when I was browsing Yale's website, because we actually used Yale's film website to teach our students. And I saw that their archivist there had two masters, one in film studies and the other in master of library science. And I thought, huh, I could do this in a sense. And I, and I found this program near me that it was that was fairly inexpensive and with films and the film studies they basically paid me to go so that's really saved me a ton of money that was the thing that's the thing i always tell people who are unsure about being a grad student but they really want to but they're worried about the money is that find a program that'll pay you to go or that will not put you in massive amounts of debt is my recommendation so even though that cuts out like nyu and those places unless you can get a scholarship there which is very hard to do but yes Right. So again, it doesn't, I think that's something you mentioned. It doesn't matter like where you study as long mm -hmm. as you get the education, right? Exactly. And, and Todd Haynes, cinematographer, actually graduated from Ohio University, Ed Lockman. So yeah, he's an Ohio University grad. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, so yeah, again, that's really, <laughs> I, I like that you're doing that. I like that you're trying to like bolster your education and, and uh, get, get more experience. So yeah. that's definitely something that I would be proud of. Hey, Molly, I got a question. Uh, Darren told me before we started recording that you uh, work at the Athens Film Festival. Can you speak yes, more to that real quick? Oh, yes. That is a film festival that happens annu annually, annually at Athens, Ohio, where Ohio University is. Okay. And I helped to be a program coordinator. And 
And mostly a lot of what film festivals, what you do is that you market it for a lot of the year and watch a copious amounts of terrible movies. It's, <laughs> it's so many, the good, and my mentor and the guy who ran, ran it, David Cole Giovanni, we actually got into this group where the, we'd always find the bad signs. Like if somebody, if someone in the, someone in, if the director is over credited, like he's writer, producer, editor, star, and it's a first film, we're just like, oh no, this yep. is not what you're <laughs> <laughs> I so, see what that. Tommy Wiseau, Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, except not as entertaining as some of them. Also, there are a lot of films that are just huge ego, ego boosters for the, for the director, and he wants people to, wants beautiful actresses to kiss them and that sort of thing. That was like obvious to tell mm -hmm. that sort of thing sort of thing like that but we also we also could david and i we synced with taste because we tended to actually enjoy the films that a lot of the other other coordinators were just like no i don't really care for this but we're like this is interesting this makes me think it's fascinating it has a suicidal clown we're gonna take it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we ended up play playing that that sort of thing i did not watch as many films as david david since i could only work on it about 10 hours a week or something like that yeah. something like that but that was and i ran the with the with the student volunteers i would actually coordinate their schedules so i'd be like okay you're gonna run the ticket booth this time oh you need to introduce this film we gotta go okay the microphone's right there here you go that sort of thing like that <laughs> sort of thing so i would do do like that when when it was going on and also make sure that the that the filmmakers would also get we gave them totes and everything like that make sure they check in make sure they they get all that stuff ready so it's a lot of fun like a, like a q a with the directors afterwards uh we did do some of that yes yes with some of the directors and everything who picks like the that. winners how does that done so that's done through a jury i remember the last year i did it we actually had Lori anderson on our jury okay. which was which was great and she was probably one of the biggest people we've ever gotten there and it was just so amazing that sh that is just like the fame the famous laurie anderson wants to come to our the rock star slash 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 director wants to come and just just be a juror and actually we actually even showcased her 3d her 3d exhibit she had and everything like that and it was and we had it worked up in one of the universe university um media centers and it was so cool what we lost in the rain was what it was called and it was it was just so fascinating even though i could barely speak to her even though i had to say say i'm sorry miss anderson i gotta take david away for a second but i was just like so nervous shaking like oh Lori. <laughs> so yeah and we also had had a um we also during that time we had a little memorial for um memorial film for joe ann anders who I'm not sure everybody knows her, but she was an Ohio University grad, and she was also Steve Buscemi's wife. And oh, yeah. Steve Buscemi starred in a ton of her films. She was she did a lot of great short films, and we showed all her short films, everything like that. Steve couldn't come, unfortunately, but but he gave his blessing and everything like that for the alma mater to to uh, make sure that her work was showcased and that was very sweet of him and he was in a bunch of those films and that was awesome to see and then remembering like oh i forgot she was married to steve <laughs> like that sort of thing so yeah it was it was really cool it's really it's really awesome it's a lot of work but it's it's a lot of fun and we get films from all around the world okay. So I guess like the, then the last thing before we go into the movie, what about the film stage? What's your experience doing that? I, I like that that's in your byline. So I actually got an internship with them, with them when I went to Sundance because I had a journalism minor from undergrad mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's where they, where my internship placed me with them. And Jordan's one of the nicest guys. So, so is Josh and they are such wonderful people. And originally I didn't even think they were going to let me still write for them, write for them. And then, and I asked Jordan, like, hey, Jordan, could I still write up, do some write-ups, that sort of thing, get my name out there still? And he said, oh, sure. And then and then I kept doing it. And then I also then got to participate in their year-end list where I got to 
put in some stuff for like best soundtrack, best movies, underseen, best cinematography. Mm -hmm. And I would get to write some of that stuff. And then I got an opportunity to publish a review with them for Nanny, which won the Grand Jury Award at Sundance. And I was so worried no one was going to pick it up. And I was like, it's so good. It was my favorite film of Sundance this year. And it was picked up by Bloomhouse. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. And I was and I'm hoping more people see that work because I think it's incredible. It just left me. It just was so it's so much tension. It's just like it made me feel very similar to watching Cries and Whispers by Ingmar mm -hmm. Bergman. If you ever felt that way, that disquiet where you feel like you're constantly a little bit on edge. Yep. And yep. That's what the film made me feel like. And I was just like any film that can make you feel that way is just like, yep that's a great film right there and i still get chills thinking about one of one of the scenes in it i'm not going to spoil it spoil it so so many people still haven't seen it unfortunately it doesn't even have a poster yet but i recommend nanny when it nanny when it comes out and i was so happy to get published and that was john fink he said said i didn't really connect to it as well but you seem to like it more do you want to write the review and i said of course and then i sent out and then I sent out, um, sent to, sent it out to Jordan, and Jordan only fixed up a few things, and then, and then he sent it to me. He said, "Like, are these edits good?" And I said, "It looks perfect. Thank you, thank you again." So then it got put on there. So I was very happy to see that, and I'm and I'm hoping people go to see the movie as well. <laughs> so again, oh, talking yeah. about the uh, the Swan Princess. Oh yes. So, something that uh, Johnny and I try to do, and it's something you talked about with Rachel. It's something that you mentioned in a, a lot of your tweets. But like one of our first episodes we did was Labyrinth, and mm -hmm. uh, we had our, our fans like wanted us to do that one. Like we got some requests, but Johnny and I always looked at each other and went, "Labyrinth is not our thing. Like we don't <laughs> we don't get it. You know what I mean?" Mm -hmm. So we brought on his Johnny's wife, who's uh, author R.J. Craddock. We brought her on to chat about that because she has. Um, a connection to that movie and we're able to see it through her point of view like she loves mm -hmm. Brian Froud and the Jim Henson yeah. stuff so, mm -hmm. and then we just had her on again for Clueless we had uh, Natasha Albar who is also on uh, Rachel's um, female film critics we talked with her about the Parent Trap remake but the reason that we love bringing other voices on is if Johnny and I aren't going to connect to the Parent Trap or aren't going to connect to Clueless or aren't going to connect to Labyrinth we want to have somebody on that connects to it, that can have that voice, mm -hmm. that can, so it's not just Johnny and I like bad mouthing the movie the whole time. So I, oh, yes. I, I think that's important having other voices. Mm -hmm. So you and I, when we were trying to figure out a, a movie to chat about, we talked about Swan Princess a bit and how you grew up. Um, I think you talked about when you were a teen, like it was one of, a movie that you watched a lot and now you've had like different experiences. Mm -hmm. So what was like your first experience with the Swan Princess and then how have, how has it gotten you here today? How has your opinion changed on that? Like, tell us your experience with the movie and then we'll talk about our experiences on this side. I first, I didn't see it in theaters because, well, I'm going to age myself. I was two when it came out. <laughs> <in theaters. laughs> and my parents had a strict rule to be like, no, no taking kids to movies or funerals till they're six. That was the <laughs> rule. It was, that was kind of a strange rule, but at least that's how it became that our first i remember my first movie being mulan because i was 1998 but i'm a huge 90s kid and i got into a princess phase a bit which my parents were like thank god she did like barbie she, she's obsessed with jurassic park she's obsessed with star wars star wars she dresses in boys clothes and power rangers that sort of thing like that so they're like I go, thank goodness, anything princess they were going to rent out for me. So that's how I got into Sailor Moon. That's how I got into Anastasia. And of course, this film, which this was just a random pick at the Blockbuster as well. R.I.P. right there. So because they always have like that, that little kid section that she had. Yeah. And so then the first time I watched it, watched it, I always I just it was kind of my Frozen back in the day, except not as good. Okay. Yes, I admit Frozen is much better than Swan Princess, but that's not a hard high bar to make. But <laughs> no. Swan Princess is not bad. Let's let's be clear here. Let's be clear here. But I would watch it a lot or just rewatch scenes. I was kind of obsessed with with um, movies where where people transformed into animals. It was kind of a thing. I watched Emperor's New Groove a lot when I was young. Beauty and the Beast was my favorite. Still one of my favorites. 
and oh god i would have watched princess and the frog so much as a kid kid if that was the case as well because i would watch that a lot <laughs> so yeah so things like that and i think my parents were just like well it's not disney so okay then and i and my parents were also not those parents who would watch it with me so i would just be with my vhs and just like pop it in and I don't think you got this, but there actually begins a few advertisements on there. One for Cartoon Network where Space Ghost arrives. And that was the thing I, re and that was one thing I remember, remembered a lot. So whenever I see Space Ghost, I'm like, from the Swan Princess? It's just like, no, from the talk show. And then Pillsbury Doughboy was advertised right before, like food items was prepared right before. And it's like, grab the cookies make the brownies it's like spliced it with images of the swan princess and all i could think was man i want a brownie right before <laughs> every show i get up like dang my mom won't let me eat sweets <laughs> dang it but then i watched it and i just could not stop watching it and so that was my first impression with it i also i also liked puffin i remember puffin was my favorite and re-watching it and i'm like yeah, no wonder Puffin was my favorite. He's the MVP of this movie. They did nothing before he came along. Yeah. Like, they're just like, like, oh, what are we supposed to do? Like, we're just like, oh, we just find this prince and everything like that. It's like, oh, how are we going to do that? Like, a puff, an Irish Puffin has to tell you what to do. Okay, then, because, yep, he's the MVP yeah. of this movie so this, and saves her multiple times and everything like that so i was like well at least i was right on that when i was a kid puffin's the best <laughs> <laughs> i have to ask did you see this with any of your kids or <laughs> no johnny and i were actually talking about this before like <laughs> we put it on last night and they just our kids can't be bothered like they're, no, they'd rather they're just like yeah play their video games and just do whatever and so i, yeah, I watched it with my wife johnny watched it with his wife <laughs> Right, right. So obviously that was from when you were like a kid. Did uh, when did you like go back and start revisiting it more like as an adult or with adults? Well, it was interesting because this is kind of embarrassing. I really got into the two sequels that came out as well, and I forced my class when I was six to a whole class of mine to watch the second movie. I don't even know why it was the second movie. I forced this whole kids, this whole class of 30 kids to watch this movie. Cause I was like, I was told, what's your favorite movie? And I was just like, like Swan Princess, the Enchanted Castle. And I'm like, why? <laughs> what was I thinking? What six year old thinks that? But apparently I did. <laughs> and that, and I still feel bad. I'm like, I forced the teachers to watch that, that <laughs> crap. And I'm like, oh no. Yeah. Oh no, it's like not even the first movie. And the first movie's just not that bad, even though it's not great, but we'll get into that, but yes. Okay, so yeah, my, uh, Johnny, what was your experience with the movie? Was it your first time watching it last night? Uh, actually, yes, all the way through. I think I had seen bits and pieces of it here and there, um, but I'd never seen it all the way through until, uh, actually tonight, I just watched it before we started recording. So we just barely finished it. Um, but that was it. I mean, <laughs> I, really didn't it. I had to kind of look at it and go, oh, John Cleese is in this. Oh, you know, Sandy Duncan's in this. Oh, yes. you know, uh, James Arrington's in this, all that kind of stuff. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. And then I think Johnny and my experience is the same. I, I know I've, I've seen the video cover. Like I remember being in my blockbuster and seeing it. And it's yeah. just one of those things where obviously I'm not a teen girl. I'm not going to, you know, pop in this one princess. So I didn't <laughs> have a little kid, little yeah, girl. Yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. girl. So, but it's always like been there like you mentioned yeah. Molly. you mentioned the swan princess oh i know that movie i've heard of it and then i think i did research was like oh this is weird like uh, i've heard nothing but bad things but it actually has like a 50 percent on rotten tomatoes yeah it's not terrible and it, when it came yeah, out no. like roger ebert gave it a positive review and yeah. so it's not like a, a horrible thing but again yeah. watching it in the uh context of like disney and dreamworks and mm -hmm. Leica studios and the uh, ghibli mm -hmm. and, and everything it's a, it's yeah. a different experience than than you're used to from seeing a lot of animation um and so mostly it was just me comparing it to disney because i know mm -hmm. in the 90s you know don blue split off a uh, split off richard mm -hmm. rich uh, split off like from disney they were fired or let go mm -hmm. or just got fed up with the atmosphere of the studio and tried to break out on their own and so just a lot of 90s attempts thumbelina was one yes uh, trying to Anastasia. Try to, right yeah. just trying to break into that disney mold yeah. so 
Yeah, beat them, join them. <laughs> right, exactly. So as far as the movie goes, like if we just wanted to chat about it, I mean, you uh, mentioned that you wanted to talk about Richard Rich a little bit, Molly. What, what's uh, fascinating about him to you? So I think I should also preface this by saying that he's directed 10 of these films. So yeah. yes, so I find that just very fascinating that he's found his little niche that he loves. Right loves that and he just loves the story he does this for the art and they, he says it doesn't even make him that much money but he just loves the story of odette and derek and i'm just like okay so this was just fascinating to me and it goes in really strange directions in the sequels but this was also an idea i think he was promulgating while he was working at disney and he always wanted to do a musical because because apparently he would sing all the time when he was working over there and then he got put into working with Fox and the Hound as the co-director for that which of course doesn't really have a lot of musical numbers and then the Black Cauldron which they of course wanted to be the super serious everything like that yeah. everything like that and so not a lot of chances for that so this was just something I think he always wanted to do doing it to do and we almost had a case where this could have been a Disney film if the Black Cauldron actually succeeded and didn't fail to the Care Bears movie mm. or anything like that and Jeffrey Katzenberg didn't change everything when he came in and just said no any and so yeah and those movies kind of saved Richard Rich's career as well because originally he wasn't gonna make another movie and then he made the Swan Princess which you know, it did okay at the box office. I think it did really well on video cassette. Yeah, enough to warrant like nine additional yeah. movies, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. at least yeah. two sequels, and then and then he takes a break for a couple years. And then he comes back and makes three D verse three D movies, and for the for the seven others that come in. So that's why there's this huge gap from the '90s to I think like twenty like 20 2005 or something like that where okay. where like something something along those lines like let's see sorry sorry swan princess series ah he also produced the alpha and omega series he's the producer for that right. and he also i found very fascinating he directed an animated film muhammad the last prophet where he actually actually did it entirely from Muhammad's perspective so that you never see the prophet himself, which I'm just like, no one's really doing this in animation. Like maybe Brenda Chapman's the closest one who would want to do something like that. But, and I found that fascinating. And of course, I think his religion plays a lot of part of that because he's a Mormon, which yep. I also have to bring up. I want to bring up because the, the composer for the movie also is is very famous in the Mormon music group. Right, Lex de Azevedo, and, right? right? Yes, right. yes. And he did the singing voice for Rothbart, which I thought for so long until about two years ago, till about a year ago, that it was Dr. John playing, singing that song. Huh. I seriously thought it was. So I thought Princess of the Frog was his second animated film he did. That's he did singing for. It's like, nope, that was nope, that was it. And I just thought that for so many years when I was a kid, like, that's Dr. John. Like, nope, it's not. So that just so yeah, but it's a good impression of Dr. John, I will say. Ask okay. with Rothbart's song, which is interesting, I shall say. But yeah, it's just fascinating. It's just like he does this all for the R and I think he produced a trailer for a live action remake for Swan Princess, which we can bring up as well when we bring that in. Bring, bring that up and everything like that. So How long ago did he do that? He, um, that was 2018, I believe that that was made. But the last film he did was Swan Princess, A Royal Wedding in 2020. So, so after the third film, it was 2012 when he went back on the series. So eight years, he made seven more films, film films, wow. just like that dedication. I'm just like, that's a little obsessive. And I'm just, I'm fascinated by people like that. I'm just, it's just fascinating to me. And us and where he where what homages he wanted to put in like he wanted to bring in Busby Busby Berkeley numbers because of course Beauty and the Beast did it we have to do it too and everything yeah. like that so yeah he 
I think he more wants to just do musicals than anything else. That's the big thing. Big thing with that, even no matter how terrible the music is. Because the music's much better in this film than it is in the sequels. The sequels, they're pretty abysmal, I will say. Yeah, they're obviously trying to ape that uh, the Disney feel for almost okay. every single. Uh, yes, movie. exactly. Well, it's interesting because Johnny and I, we're from Utah. And so growing up Mormon, like we're mm -hmm. familiar with like the Living Scriptures videos, which is where, yeah. you know, Richard, he, Rich, he split off from Disney and he was approached by, a, what was his name? A Jared F. Brown from Living Scriptures. And so he's produced a lot of those animated like mm -hmm. uh, Bible stories and things like yes. that. And then they are able to kind of pull their resources and decide, well, if we're going to compete with Disney, what should we do? And that's how they came up. Obviously copying the, uh, or adapting mm -hmm. the Tchaikovsky uh, uh, ballet. The ballet, yes, except the happy <laughs> ending. So this time, right, yeah. right, there's right, several, so. there are several endings, not just Black Swan, I think makes everybody thinks it's where she kills herself. That's what I was like, like, no, there's, there's like, there's like 10 versions, 10 endings. So it's like any version of Swan Lake you go to, you're like, I wonder which ending this is going to be. And that's sort of right. like, like, kind of like a surprise. clue. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> surprise ending. Right. Well, it's interesting, like reading the history of actual Swan Lake. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, I know that Tchaikovsky, when he was writing it, like, he also did the Sleeping Beauty ballet. And so yes, if you look did. at Disney took all a lot of the a lot of the music for for their version of Sleeping Beauty. It's like, like I know you, I walk with you. That actually comes from the waltz from Sleeping right. Beauty. That melody. So every single time I hear that melody, I start to sing that song, and I'm like, no, that's not how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so yeah, Sleeping Beauty. I know if you go into the history of it, he's got extensive notes. Like Tchaikovsky has extensive notes for how the play is mm -hmm. supposed to be produced. But it was saying something in this one, like that there are no detailed notes like that. So that's why a lot of when they adapt it, it seems like they're able to do like, you know, same same music or librettos or stuff like that. But they exactly. can do whatever endings they want. So it's interesting. Exactly. They go the tragic. Obviously, for a cartoon, you don't want to go the tragic. Of route. course not. No, no, it's <laughs> be more like breaking off Rothbart's wing, which is one of the more popular happy endings to break the curse and everything like that. But. Right. But yeah, that's, but yeah, that's, of course, you don't want to do that, even though Disney did do the, did the, did a tragic ending one time with the little matchstick girl, they did do it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, they actually did the sad ending. I was just impressed. Shocked by that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the ending for this one was funny too, how they, it was basically Sleeping Beauty. You know, Rothbard it was, yeah, an exactly. And, with the dragon. <laughs> right. And then he stabs him in the, or shoots him with the arrow and he dies. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I don't know if either of you noticed, like my first note, like in the movie, within seconds, I was like, this looks like a living scriptures movie. So I, I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's my thought. Yeah. But I but I also like I didn't do the I knew that Richard Rich was um uh and, and I wrote a history of some Disney movies. I, I just mm -hmm. it didn't put two and two together that he directed a co-directed the Black Cauldron. And so when mm -hmm. I put that together, I was like, oh. The animation looks a lot like the Black Cauldron. Like it does. The, it doesn't have like the supple, like the nuances of a lot of the, the bigger Disney movies. Yes, but, but the but more than, are gorgeous. <laughs> right, right. So more than like the living scriptures, I thought it was, the movie looked like it should have come out 15 years before. Yeah, <laughs> it really does. Yeah, so if it had came out in the 80s, I would have been, oh, this, this works. But, you know, talking about it, this came out after Little Mermaid, after Beauty and the Beast, after the same year as The Lion King. And so mm -hmm. it just doesn't compete. It has the Black Cauldron look, which is which is fine. There's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with the character work in the animation. Mm -hmm. But I I just thought looking at it just there's to me there's no wonder why it kind of failed at the box office. It's mm -hmm. trying to appeal to the Disney crowd, but the animation I don't know Molly did you did you think that too? I like watching the 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 dance sequences, especially like the princesses on parade kind oh, of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. All the the backgrounds they're not. The, the background characters don't quite move. It just seems like they don't have the same. Yeah, they're just very static. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, I know they're trying to do the movements and sometimes, sometimes they do it, but it doesn't quite match that. Johnny, did you, did you have any thought? Did you think that too, watching the musical? Movie? Well, yeah, like you, my first thought was the animation isn't up to par. It's not mm -hmm. what I would expect it to be. Um, it did remind me of like the Disney sequels that go straight to DVD. Yes. That's exactly what I thought, like, you know, Return uh, of Jafar or whatever it's mm -hmm. called. And yeah. all the new one twos and the, you know, all those movies. That, Christmas, you know, all that right, stuff. Right. So yeah. it had that quality and that kind of look. And so right away, I was kind of like not really interested because I was like, this is not what I want to be watching. <laughs> <laughs> I want this to see the, the more polished and the, more, the better quality animation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, if it came out in the 80s, like in 85, 86, yeah. I thought it would have been, but it's just weird seeing this like old, like rotoscoping. Yeah. 
It's um, also kind of weird when you notice how few guards there are in this movie. Because people have brought that up just like, how is it that that the Brid that the servant Bridget, yes, I know her name, know her name, <laughs> could just get through the guards and everything like that. Just yeah. like there's no guards and there's only one that comes in, everything like that, and only like a couple guards that take down Rothbart's Roth Rothbart's potions never in the Forbidden Arts stuff at the beginning. For beginning, like it only takes like five guards and everything like that to get that done, but then he just he takes out ten and then there's hardly any other guards, and you're like okay then it's like that's something the fans have even discussed just like that's why people can just sneak into the castle and everything like that there's just no guards and it's just like there are no guards because the budget's so low <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's again yeah. it's it's not watching the movie the movie's not terrible it's not like i've it's seen worse right. animated movies. Mm -hmm. yeah. but you can just tell that again they don't have the resources to pull exactly. off the same kind of dynamism mm -hmm and, and mm -hmm. supple animation the, the disney movies mm -hmm. um johnny what about the uh the actors what you wanted to chat a little bit about them How do you uh, yeah them? but first let's i want to say this um i didn't know at first it was a musical i had no idea until they started singing and i thought oh it's a musical and then i was let down again by the poor <laughs> songwriting in there <laughs> So first of all, bad animation and then the songs are not well written no they're not <laughs> So, you know, negative 0 for 2 so far. But the other thing, that, that's what kind of got my attention because uh, I didn't know that John Cleese was in there and I recognized his voice right away. And then I it's didn't know- It's French like guard said, voice from Monty Python, right, basically. Right, right. Which is, which is fun to, you know, kind of listen to that. And then also uh, Sandy Duncan was in there. And then um, Jack Palance was in there, I think, too, right? Yes, he was uh, as Rothbard. They even had yeah. him doing the one-arm push-up in that yeah. scene yeah. that he did when he won his Oscar. That's right. <laughs> and, and of course, Stephen Wright as the turtle, you know, that was- yeah. Fun, even though the turtle kind of looked weird, but yeah. uh, I, I like hearing Stephen Wright's voice. He's got a, a cool sounding voice. Yeah. Um, and then well, and it, it fits the turtle, right? His name is Speedy. Yeah, but it's Stephen yeah. yeah. In fact, that's yeah. funny because I had a turtle named Speedy growing up. <laughs> so I was kind of like taking back to my childhood there. Friends but, call me yeah. uh, One one interesting side note is though that uh, one of my acting teachers in college, James Arrington, he plays the Chamberlain, Sir Chamberlain. Oh, wow. That kind of gave him his whole career and. Uh, so he was always uh, kind of admired in, at, you know, in class because he was in the Swan Princess movies, yes. um, even though I'd never seen him. Um, <laughs> he's he a good actor. He's also done some other stuff. He uh, was in a one-man play called the Farley Family Reunion, I think. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he was in some other movies like Brigham Young, I think, or, or Brigham. It's called Brigham. Oh, yeah. But anyway, he's a good actor. Um, he's still around, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Anyway, it was fun to kind of see his his performance as Chamberlain in this too. Did he give you any acting advice that you can kind of carried with you? To you know what's funny? Uh, not really. He, he oh. got mad at me once because I wanted to uh, direct one of my one act plays in this like one act play competition, and he wouldn't let me because it was it was too uh, racy or something. Oh. <laughs> it was too mature, and so he didn't want me to do it, and so I kind of got mad at him. But anyway, oh. also uh, I have a story to tell. It was a funny moment when I was. In, he directed the play Greece, and I was in oh. Greece. And, and there was a moment where he directed a lot of the background uh, actors to like throw their bodies against the brick wall, like on the. And we were like, "What is he doing?" And we were like, "So shocked! Like, is he serious? Like, is this what we're doing? We're what? throwing our bodies against this brick wall during the song?" I was like, "This what? can't be right." <laughs> but it, it was. We didn't do it, but it was funny about yeah, connection, and we were like, "No, we're not doing that." <laughs> oh, thank goodness, no. <laughs> Anyway, you got to know your limits. Yeah, yeah, when I think of James Arrington, I think of that story. I think of watching him show us how to do it. We were like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Did he ever explain why he wanted no, to? No, he was just, I don't know what it was. It was a really weird moment. I was like, this is weird, really strange. But anyway, just I think to, he's just, a funny guy. He's he a, he's just a funny do it. He, you would just do it, and he would probably laugh if you did it. <laughs> like, I can't believe you did it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, yeah, the... Uh, I don't know the uh, the other actors too. The what is her name? Michelle DeCastro or, or and uh, Michelle DeCastro, yes. And um, I can't remember the guy who plays Derek's name was Howard Man McGillen. Hair. I'm trying to remember his name. <laughs> Howard McGillen is what I have here. Yes, here. yes. He only was in the first film. Yeah. Michelle DeCastro. Michelle DeCastro. She did this two other sequels as well, and she couldn't do the other ones because she she unfortunately died before the other oh. sequels came out. 
breast and brain cancer. So, so yeah, so sorry to bring this down, but yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yes, but the fans love her work and everything like that, that they have a whole wiki about and everything like that. And just like, I did research and I was like, oh, they appreciate that. And she, yeah. she did pretty well for such a, a flimsy written character, I will say, unfortunately, but yeah. yeah but, did on. anybody else think that Derek was kind of an idiot? Yes, he was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will like, I will like to say that at least he's not Prince Siegfried like most of the adaptations call call him because that's his name in Swan Lakes. And it's yeah. just like I don't know where Siegfried would fit in there, but Derek is like so 90s. So Yeah, I thought it was weird that the only like did has he only read fairy tales? Like does he read fairy like because that's all they could come up with, like, oh you're beautiful. And then like what does they say at the end? He's like, uh They're just oh, like you have beauty kindness, your kindness and, courage. and courage. Yes. Yeah, and I'm like, that's yeah. that, how hard was that? Like how hard was that to come up with two extra words? Like I know. Yeah. It was and I, it's also because I feel the, especially the 90s felt like we have to have immoral to our stories yeah. and everything like that. Just like, just like we got to, we got to have a good lesson. The kids got to learn everything like that. And they forgot Jerry. I feel this is just pure conjecture, but I feel like, okay, we have to have this little breakup thing to happen. Let's put that into a lesson about how you need to admire girls for more than just your beauty. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it makes sense. Like ugly, ugly swans, like everything. She was an ugly duckling. Now she's come a swan, that sort of thing like that. Let's just tangentially connect it like that. Like, <laughs> that's what right. I, that's what I, my conjecture right there is what it is. Well, I didn't know if it was making a comment on fairy tale stuff at the time, like about like just beauty is all you can really say. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the movie's that deep. As far no, as trying to do that, um, so the, the 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 one thing that I really noticed, other than it trying to copy a lot of the Disney stuff, and the as far as the characters go, like I said, the the animation isn't bad. Like they they move like mm -hmm. uh, Sleeping Beauty, they move like Snow White. It's the rotoscoping yeah. stuff. Like it, it doesn't mm -hmm. look terrible. The yeah. animal stuff is what I really liked. Like yeah. that's that's where it kind of came alive and yes. was fit the Disney mold a little bit. Um, so I like that interaction there. What I noticed though, and maybe I don't know if two of you are, are into that, are that into Don Bluth, but Don Bluth, when he broke off from Disney, he had mm -hmm. one really good movie. He had Secret of Nim that was all his, right? It was yes. full of detail mm -hmm. and, and everything going for it. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I think he kind of slipped away or he didn't have the same control, or maybe he kind of expended all his like uh, energy on Secret of Nim. Because when you watch Don Bluth movies like Lamb Before Time, which I like, yeah. or American Tale, yeah. which I like, and we've covered yeah. on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're, they're great heartfelt moments, but they're also, it's not Disney because there are moments that seem like they're missing, like from yes, in between scenes. Mm -hmm. What I noticed in this one was, okay, so we don't see um, Odette get kept kidnapped. We see the yep. aftermath of it. The next time we see her, she's already a swan. Yeah. Like there's no, did, did you have any thoughts on that, Molly? There's like no reaction from, she's just a swan. It's like they cut out yeah. the entire character building. What did, what did you think? Like, it was interesting because I was always thinking, because I think we just had to infer then that, oh, she rejected the marriage proposal and that sort of thing, which I actually thought as a kid, and I still think it's kind of brilliant in a sense, was getting forcing her to marry him because because then it's just like, yeah, you do spend your whole life fighting to keep a kingdom if you conquer it or something like that. So, yeah, what I didn't like was when he's like, no, I'm just going to not do that anymore. I'm just going to kill her, you know, just just like out of spite and everything like that but yeah that was always kind of strange to me and then you just watch it you're like oh i feel like you're missing the prologue scene with like i know you can't do the stained glass windows like with beating the beast where you explain how he got his curse or something like that like no you can't do that or you can't show like her transforming the first time and him placing the curse on her like with ariel turning into a human that you can't do that you apparently don't have the budget or something like that so yeah. So that's also why they had always had her transform with the water because no, we're not going to show her transforming right there. We're going to have the water obscure it and everything like that because we don't have the budget for that. Right. But at least it was pretty. So it's a pretty effect. So yeah, it was very Cinderella ish, I thought, yes. changing her into yes. a swan. So yeah, there was the part where she becomes a swan. We don't see a reaction. Like she's mm -hmm. already befriended the Speedy characters and the, uh, uh, the Jean Bob characters. There's no like reaction. You don't see her, oh, I can talk to animals. Now. Like, yeah, no, missing, no. It's missing a lot of those interstitial moments that would kind of exactly. Flesh out. You don't really know how long it's been because you're just yeah. like, and it's not like with Beating the Beast where that's not the important thing, but you're like, 
they're saying she's gone. She's not coming back. She's dead. That sort of thing like that. And you're like, how long has it been? How has, has it been months? Has it been a year? Yeah. And if so, she hasn't tried to fly to try to figure out where she is and that sort of thing like that. Just like, no, never tried or that sort of thing. At least with Swan Lake, she had those Swan Maidens to keep her company. Yeah. But you're still just like, like you're trying to think to yourself, like, why? I just kind of assumed as a kid that when she was transformed into this one, like, oh, she now knows how to talk to animals because she was turned into an animal. So, but then the sequels changed that because then Derek was able to talk to Puffin and Sean Bob and like, wait, you were not turned into an animal and Forbidden right. Arms was not there. You shouldn't be able to talk to them, talk to them and understand them. This is <laughs> wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so it's making a lot of those leaps in logic. Um, that again, I noticed with Don Blue's later stuff, it's like, again, they just don't have the resources to do this. And no, they don't. That's where it's the most noticeable to me. It just the story doesn't seem, they don't have like an army of people working on the story to make sure that it flows. Yeah, no, everything, yeah. Everything matches. Mm -hmm. And then you're right about Puffin. It's weird because that song, what was it? No Fear. Yeah, they're, No Fear. They're kind of like, they're just farting around. They're not doing anything. And then yeah. Puffin comes in and goes, why don't we do this? And all of a sudden they're into the song and they're on a mission. I was like, yes, oh, like, exactly. did I miss something? Like, why are I they know. all of a sudden just doing stuff? So again, yeah. just, just a lot of those, a lot of those things. Um, as far as maybe, uh, maybe a last kind of thing, was there anything that the two of you, do you have like a couple of things that you actually liked and thought did match? Is there, I know I talked about the animals when they do it for me. Was there any particular moment or a couple of moments that you, that either of you liked? Molly, did you have any that, that did kind of stand out? any moments i will say that new disney has actually made me nostalgic for villains like rothbart because i just kind of miss those villains that were just devilishly ghoulish and we're just so happy just like even one of his first lines with odette is just like this thing gives me no pledge sort of pleasure well maybe a teensy bit and you're just like oh and jack pounce is having so much fun playing yeah. this role and i actually kind of like the climax i there's urgency it's really paced very well well and you're actually really hoping he doesn't give that bow to Bridget in this in this and of course as a kid I was like how could you mistake this she's got the black dress but it's a reference to Swan Lake where she, the black swan comes in comes in so I didn't really get that as a kid but as an adult I understand that understand that and I'm just like I'm actually feeling that tension too I'm feeling a little bit of that tension and then the battle scene happens and with the arrow and everything and I do like that there's planting and payoff in this film because yes they do the they do the catch and fire where with the apple and everything and then it's like oh that's how it's gonna and then it brings up that Derek knows how to catch arrows in midair so that's actually going to be effective in the climax and i was just like that's actually really clever clever so i really liked i like that climax that sort of thing like that but then and it's kind of it's like it's kind of dampened by the fact that then you get to the finale and then every single film ends with them saying something really really corny to each other just like like you promised to love me Derek till the day I die no much longer than that and then every sequel has something corny like that happen at the end so it's just very so yeah but I those were parts I liked I I like to say the film is adequately acceptable <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good way to put it Johnny what about you were there any moments that were actually good <laughs> uh, I can't think of many, um, so I tuned out pretty quickly. Um, yeah. The only thing that kept my attention was John Cleese and Stephen Wright. I kept waiting for their scenes and, and waiting yeah. to see how they're going to do. And they're the only thing that kept me interested at all. Everything else, I was like, this is not worth my time. <laughs> right. You well, can say that John Cleese has played the Frog Prince twice because yeah, he did it in yeah. Shrek as well. That's yeah. right. Yes, he did. Um, I thought that was interesting too, like the animation on the frog really mm -hmm. reminded me of Prince Naveen's animation and Princess yes. and, and Princess in the Frog. Just the, the French accent, first of all, just the mm -hmm. way that he's moving and, and making like mm -hmm. gestures. I was like, did they did they copy <laughs> this for Princess in the Frog? They maybe did. I would not be surprised, honest, honestly. Very, very similar, I thought. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking about the music, I didn't mind that first one. Like, this is my idea. I like that they're yeah. setting it up and, you know, that yeah. whole, they're they're trying to do the Disney. Like, you can tell they're trying to do that Disney stuff. It's not horrible. Like, I, I don't know if I like a Rothbart song that much because listening it to it now, I was like, that's not Jack Pal 
Lance. Like it's yeah. <laughs> the voice is obviously different. Um, but I do like, and then the as far as the ballad goes, the uh, the far longer than forever. I thought it as far as them singing and how they're juxtaposing like them on different sides of the kingdom and and kind of like melding the images. I thought that was fine. Again, they're attempting to do the Disney stuff. Yeah, and they did get Broadway actors, Liz Calloway, and I don't know the guy's name, but. Yeah, what's interesting is that I think the best song was one that was not even in the movie. And I'm not sure if you guys heard of it or saw it's from this Japanese pop band group called Dream Dreams of Things to Come, I believe it is. It's it called Eternity. And they the music video is on YouTube and it's sung by this Jap Japanese singer and she's singing it phonetically, I believe. And mm -hmm. And I'm just like, why wasn't this in the movie? This is actually the best song. <laughs> it's just like nope it wasn't there it's just like so yeah i recommend listening to that song at least it's fun and you wouldn't even notice it was swan princess really except they intercut it with scenes from the movie hmm. and i would watch it a lot it was always at the after the end credits of the swan princess vhs tape get your tape and everything like that so so and it was the one that was not that i think it was co-written by um the the composer, I'm messing up, up, I messed up his name, but it was mostly written by that group, which is probably why it's better. <laughs> better. <laughs> yeah, not quite up to stuff. I, I, and then the last thing, I guess, I, I did like, I mean, I'm not going to listen to it on rotation or anything, but the the pop version, um, uh, Regina Bell, who I think sang on The Whole New World. Is that what she said? Oh, oh yeah. I can't remember, but like uh, Regina Bell and Jeffrey Osborne, they sang that. Um, mm -hmm. Very Disney-esque. I think it even sounded yeah. like Beauty and the Beast. A, a couple yeah. times there are a few notes mm -hmm. in there so as far as a ballad goes and a pop single i thought well that's obviously that's very disney and that's what they're trying yeah. to shoot for mm -hmm. so so yeah as a as a whole swan princess not the worst experience i've had yeah. do either one of you have any last things to to mention or any last ideas before we move on to that final segment mm -hmm. molly do you have anything to add oh. i i will say that just i think that if I if somebody asked me like do you think the swan princess warrants existing I think it does honestly I mean it's brought joy to a lot of people it's still got a very dedicated fan base I just think there are I think the negative reviews and anything are mostly people being cringe about it like oh why did I like this and this sort of thing like that and realizing that oh wait it's not that bad it's just that the sequels just made it worse in retrospect because there's just so many because there are and this one guy, he's happy doing what he wants. And this is what brought him back to animation because he almost lost his whole livelihood and everything after he was sacked for Black Cauldron. Yeah. So, and this is what sparked his creative vision. And now we've got things like Alpha and Omega from it, which has its fans and sort of thing and that stuff. So I say, yeah, it warrants existing. I think, I think it's fine fine and it makes him happy so richard rich happy and richie rich happy so <laughs> <laughs> yeah richie rich needs to be happy so so basically yeah. what you're saying it, it is for you it's worth it's a movie that's worth remembering it's not something mm -hmm. that uh, should be written off written yeah no system. It it's, does... tried. it's tried it's much better than most disney sequels i will say okay yeah the directed video stuff so so yeah mm -hmm. i, I kind of see that johnny what i think i know what you're thinking but what do you what do you think yeah, I would say it's worth a remake. I think it's kind of uh, equal to those those Disney sequels. I think it's kind of the same type of movie. And I mm -hmm. think the animation could be better today. And I think they could also um, just do a better job with the story. The story was weak. I think mm -hmm. uh, overall, it could be a better movie. It could be a better experience because uh, I found myself getting really bored several times. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Molly, I, I do agree with you. It has a place. It has made people happy. I, there's, mm -hmm. there is a better, I don't know, maybe you could do like a Sleeping Beauty version where you do do the, the ballet and you do maybe. try to animate it, make it yeah. more, I don't, I don't know if that would work, but I you know. Right, better song. I think there, yeah, I think there was a pretty, a really, the best version of Swan Lake I think I've seen is, I'm not sure if you heard of the anime Princess Tutu. It's I think this, so. Yeah, the series and really inspired by that and the Nutcracker and Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty and bringing all the Tchaikovsky plays together for this young girl who's actually a duck. And it's a it's a great anime. And I think it's probably the closest thing to a great Swan Swan Lake adaptation. We we have honestly like the best one that's not just Swan Lake, the ballet itself. Right. Okay. So, yeah. I do yeah. not want a live action remake of Swan Princess no, though. Let's I not say. do that. 
<laughs> no, no, I'm not sure. I posted on Twitter an image. They had this really bad CGI Jean Bob and Speed uh -huh. right there, and they looked like it looked like cat CGI right there. And I was like, Oh God! Yeah, no, oh, no, God. no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like you, like you said in your cat review, you're wondering if CGI was a mistake. Yeah, you know. exactly exactly <laughs> so yeah so we've got like you you obviously think that it's got a place it's, it's worth remembering even though it's not fantastic johnny's obviously yeah. you can and i'm kind of in the same camp as both of you it's like i get that it's made an impact but i it can also be done better like you could take yeah. it and really make it pop and, and really make it work but again it's, it's not a movie that i'm angry at if that makes any sense yeah so yeah. but uh yeah okay so that's the swan princess molly again we like I said, we've been chatting on Twitter for a bit. Just to kind of talk about you, just really quickly, uh, reading like some of your reviews. I know like we talked about the Cries and Whispers review and the Cats yeah. review. I like your your bat the Batman reviews. Like this is uh, Lego Batman's favorite Batman movie. Yes. <laughs> Again, it's just that those few words and that sentence just sums up. That's a great review of that. Yeah. But also reading your reviews of everything uh, everywhere all at once. Reading your reviews of the worst person in the world. Reading mm -hmm. your review of a uh, Joker and your wow. the nihilism like point one. Mm -hmm. Your longer in depth reviews, but it is some of the best writing that that I've, it's it can be up there with like again major critics. I hope that uh, I know that's not what you're aiming yeah. for right now, but yeah. it's you've got the in depth and the the insight and stuff. And yeah. those reviews. I, I hope you write a lot more of the longer reviews because I even though I love the the small. And that's what I mean, like those, just that one sentence or those sentence reviews, they say everything that needs to be said, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love that you, when you dive more in depth, like, again, I was like, wow, she's a great writer. Like, I, I hope she writes more of these long, like in-depth reviews that she really goes into the history and like what it means and the, mm -hmm. like the, the insight and the themes and stuff like that. So, yeah. so definitely like check out, uh, it's Letterboxd, right? That you're, that you write a lot of those on. Yes, I do. And I also have a, have a, WordPress as well, even though I don't use it as often. So Letterboxd's box is probably the best, best that sort of thing like that. Okay. So, yeah. so how would uh, how would people reach you and how are people contact you or, or follow you? What, what are some ways that they can reach you on social media? Well, I'm Molly Raspberry on Instagram. I'm also on Twitter, Twitter Raz, at Raz Raspberry. That's my dad's nickname. So that's how, how I got that right there right there. So, so yeah. And also my letterbox is right there, right there on there. And I constantly also post from my word, from my WordPress press blog, even though I think I do much better with letterbox, even though I do put it on my blog, because my blog also goes into not just film reviews, but also stuff I wrote from grad school and other other um, other articles about things that that interest me. I'm also thinking about writing on drive my car and Stanislavski acting, mm -hmm. acting method and check off, check off. It's still promulgating in my mind. So before I put it pen to paper, but that would most that would be in my WordPress if I have that, have that, that sort of thing like that. Right. Again, me shaking my head right there. That's like, again, interesting ways of attacking things and interesting yeah. ideas as far as writing. And so, yeah, if, if you publish those or write those, I definitely I definitely want to read those and definitely want oh, to, thank you. to check yeah. that out again. Your, your insight into Wonder Woman 1984, like really impressive. Just uh, every, like I was saying, everything about your voice, like we need more of that. And so I hope that uh, the, the, the grad thing goes well. I hope that you're able to go into the library uh, study and things like and, and really be able to do what you want to do. Yeah. Because it sounds like you'd be you'd be a great benefit to that. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> as, as, being, as, as well as it being a benefit to you. So, um, Johnny, any other questions you had for uh, no, but thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Again, thank you for lending that voice. We're able to at least look at this movie and figure out a way to not completely bad now. But I appreciate exactly, it. exactly. Find some good. Yeah, I always that. try to find some good. Right. Okay. Yeah. So again, Molly, I appreciate you. Hopefully we'll have you back on uh, at some point. Oh, in the future. Yes. Maybe pick another one of these uh, rich, oh, yeah. rich movies <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and chat about that. But Sequels yeah, will have to be bad mouthed upon because I'm not sure there's much salvageable with those, honestly. All right. <laughs> well, we'll figure something out. Molly, yeah. again, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank Thanks you. For having me again. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Right. What? You're all I ever wanted. You're beautiful. Thank you. But what else? What else? Is beauty all that matters to you? <clears throat> Derek? What else? I, uh, uh, 
what else is there? And welcome back again. We want to thank Molly Raspberry for uh, joining us and having a chat about this one, Princess. Uh, I don't know about you, Johnny. I, I love the conversations we're able to bring other voices in just so if we don't connect to it, we have somebody else that does so it doesn't kind of limit our scope of the conversation. Yeah, I do sometimes feel bad, though, because I have a hard time <laughs> seeing their point of view. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. it's fun having them on. Right. So at least they've got a point of view. I mean, that's, that's right. great that we're able to kind of counter that with our lack of a point of view, I guess you could say. Yeah. <laughs> so again, we like look forward to uh, resuming those conversations in the future. Again, thanks, Molly, for joining us. We appreciate it. So chatting a little bit about it, obviously, Swan Princess has a lot of Disney aping ability. Like it wants to be a Disney movie, kind of like Don Bluth, like American Tale and Lamb of Time, want, and it's Anastasia especially, want to be Disney movies. And a lot of times all these studios, unless they have the backing, like million dollar, multi-million dollar budget backing, like a DreamWorks would have, or like a Sony Animation Studios kind of thing would have. Um, so they don't use to succeed, especially like in the 90s, that kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of hard for them to compete because you're always making comparisons to Disney, right? You're, yeah. you're always comparing, well, Disney would do well, that. Well, that's the gold standard, right? So Yeah, and it has been forever. Um, to the point where Disney's kind of like, um, fragile about it. I know Swan Princess failed at the box office. We didn't talk about this. I think it cost 18 million, only made 9 million. Oh, because really? one of its competitors, Disney re-released The Lion King into theaters at the same mm. time. And like we talked about, if you're going to look at it, why would you want to move to go see the Swan Princess when you've got the, the wowza appeal of The Lion King and the animation and the animals and how adult it was? You know, you're going to want to gravitate towards that. Right. So, but again, Disney's kind of... Um, they're kind of nervous about that stuff. They want to make sure that they have the hold on, on the industry, that kind of thing. But, you know, you look at studios now, you look at obviously Don Bluth, we talked about him. He had that, I guess, Sacred and would be his one real competitor, you know. Yeah, I really like that one. Yeah, that's great when it's dark, it's dangerous, it has a lot of incredible detail. And then like we mentioned, talking with Molly, he, he kind of lost it a little bit and kind of didn't have the same resources. Um, you're looking at the uh, DreamWorks animation we talked about, Sony Pictures animation. Um, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse is one of like one of the movies I've seen in the last decade that's just been wow like this is gonna it's breaking ground and it's gonna last that kind of thing so they've got that Blue Sky has Ice Age um, Studio Ghibli we've talked about them before anime is a different different animal I know that um, it's hard for me to get an anime but every now and then like a Grave of the Fireflies or my neighbor Totoro or Akira kind of sneaks in there and goes wow like this really makes a dent like and has a an attitude and like a, a scope that most animated movies don't. Um, like uh, obviously with the stop motion stuff, Coraline's a big one. So you've got all these movies that really like, I don't know if they surpass Disney, but they definitely stand up to Disney. They're, they're either equal or they're better than a lot of Disney. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so every now and then they do sneak by and <sighs> DreamWorks is one of those ones where I think they're more, I have a hard time with DreamWorks unless it's like a How to Train Your Dragon or a Kung Fu Panda, even Kung Fu Panda, but where it's more about like stars and like in jokes and like pop culture references where Shrek comes out. And even though it's funny, it dates itself within the first five minutes, like by playing yeah. All Star from Smash Mouth, that kind of thing. So I have a hard time with DreamWorks because they don't make movies that last. They make movies that are like for now. So if I were to pick, like if we were to pick like our top movies that, that, either for the first time rival Disney or that we really think just blew, blew Disney out of the water. DreamWorks, I think Prince of Egypt um, is probably their top DreamWorks movie. Just because It has like the cast stuff. I know that Sandra Bullock and Jeff Goldblum in it are distractions um, to have in there where it's like, oh, they're not really playing characters. They're just playing themselves, um, that kind of thing. But as far as the I just remember sitting in a theater and I think we saw it as a group, you were in a group or whatever, and I took yeah, my yeah. soon to be wife and um, watching that movie just, again, it's the antithesis of the Swan Princess. When the, the songs are majestic, the songs are powerful. They're not just out there for jokes. The backgrounds of the characters, it's very dynamic. There's just the animation, just gorgeous and it blows you out of the water. And that's what I'm talking about, about having resources. And again, it does, there are sequences like the death of the firstborn. It's all like charoscuro. It's like black and white. You have uh, the opening sequence, Deliver Us, which pow, you know, the Hans Zimmer kind of Stephen Schwartz kind of musical grandeur 
kind of really sticks out. The When You Believe song, we're talking about ballads. That won the Oscar, of all things. I know we don't need to talk about Oscars, but it had that enough power to win the Oscar and take it away from whatever Disney movie was nominated. Yeah. yeah. So, Prince of Egypt, have you, uh, I know that, I remember your reaction when we went to go see it as you, you were kind of, I don't know if your reaction was like, it's not Disney, so I don't know if I should like it. Like, what was your initial thought? I, I, I remember thinking that I liked it. I just, I just didn't, uh, I don't think I liked it as much as you, but I do uh, recall the memory of us singing the soundtrack, like on road trips and stuff. So, so I recall doing that with you and that was right. kind of the, like the plagues, like Ramesses. Yeah. Ramesses yeah. Like that but one. I enjoy the movie. I think it's a good movie. Okay. But yeah, that's, if I could pick one, I don't know if it's like my top, like I mentioned, like Spider-Man and the spider Verses. I don't usually throw the word masterpiece around, but that's a movie that my brain keeps going back to and thinking it does all these things. Like I'm amazed by it, the groundbreaking of the animation, the way that it says that every Spider-Man is like worth, uh, worth existing in this world of like my Batman's better than your Batman, that kind of thing, or the message that it says that anybody can wear a mask. So Spider-Verse is like masterpiece level filming, but Prince of Egypt, even though it has like the DreamWorks flaws, that was the first movie I remember seeing in a theater where I thought this is a studio that is going to rival Disney, even though they kind of, I know they make a lot of money, but like as far as indelible classic movies goes, I don't know if DreamWorks is quite up there still with DreamWorks. They kind of maybe tarnished their reputation. Yeah, they're probably second best. (laughs) best. Yeah, but Prince of Egypt, again, that was one that was like, whoa, this is going to go somewhere. But what, uh, what movie did you think of? Well, you mentioned stop motion earlier, and um, I, I thought about movies that I enjoy that are stop motion, and mainly because I've seen so many of these 2D animated movies, and this one, uh, Swan Princess, was just so flat and boring as far as animation goes, and so um, I want to mention a movie that I watched uh, back in, I don't know when it was, it was a while ago, but it was at Sundance Film Festival, mm-hmm. and um, it's called Mary and Max directed by Adam Elliott and it has Philip Seymour Hoffman and Tony Collette as the star in roles and it's just so well done and Adam Elliott he won the uh, Oscar for the best animation short movie okay. uh, animated short movie which was Harvey Crumpet and um, the very next thing he did was Marion Max and he had a lot of expectations of this next movie of being something great and so I don't think it did very well I don't think much people know about it but it's a small little movie and I still really like it. I, I like movies like that, like The Isle of Dogs and uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox or, you know, Coraline, like you mentioned, some of those kind of movies. I, I think those are fun to look at because I, like I say, I get bored. I get tired of the, the 2D and the 3D. I like watching the stop motion. And I think Mary and Max, as far as the story goes, it's a little bit darker. And I think it's just um, the characters are well developed and it's a good story. Well, what's it about? Like, I, I know I've, I told you, like, when you were mentioning it, I've seen pictures of it, so I know what it is. It, I, it's been so long. I have to, <laughs> it's been so long, but I know there's like, there's like a letter, like, like pen pals or something like that, or there's a letter writing thing going on. I actually forgot, but I'll have to research it. Um, you, you do remember I, the animation. I just really, really liking it and really kind of getting mesmerized by the characters and what mm-hmm. I was seeing on screen. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, it's definitely something I'm going to have to add to my list. Just be more, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's more yeah. people will see more off this thing just attached to that kind of and tony collette obviously kind of make my antenna kind of quiver there to be able to yeah that. so yeah I'll, we, we mentioned stuff like secret of them we mentioned spider verse we mentioned Coraline, iron giants like warner brothers animation iron giant is really up there but then brad bird obviously got to port it over to pixar pixar's i guess that's folded into disney so we can't really count that but pixar's like again they they're they're up there with a lot of their animation and groundbreaking things and just yeah. what they've been able to do so you, we could mention every pixar movie the toy stories um ratatouille you know all, all these things we could we could mention and it'll get people going ah yeah like that's that's fantastic that kind of thing up uh, oh yeah or, i love that or uh you know just bugs life maybe to a certain extent <laughs> i know inside out it's great like they just had um like as a turning red came out so so pixar is up there a lot of good Despicable Me. Have you ever? Do you like the Despicable Me movies? Uh, not so much. Are they okay? okay? Yeah, the I'm, I'm not a Minions fan, and I don't like the Illumination animation. I'm not a fan of their look. I don't know what it is. Like the Sing movies and things like that, or the Secret Life of Pets. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. The animation is just kind of a turnoff. I don't like their character designs. But uh, the Despicable Me movies, at least the first two, they they are appealing maybe for Steve Carell or the little girls that that kind of thing. So. 
that kind of works. But again, a lot of good animation out there um, to be able to check out, not just the Swan Princess. I know that they tried, but it didn't really quite work as well as they wanted yeah. to. Uh, so definitely a lot of a whole new world uh, to quote another Disney movie. But uh, so this, again, this counts as our season finale. This is like season That's right. Uh, you are, we need a break every now and then. We didn't look like, like 27 episodes every time, but you are moving into a house like we talked about. Yep, about nine blocks away from here. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you're in like a starter home with like, I think the bedroom is just off to your left. Yeah. And the bathroom is off to your right. <laughs> it's been pretty cramped the past year, but we're moving into a, a nice four bedroom, two and a half bath. So we're looking forward to it. Sweet, sweet. And so that's obviously going to take up a lot of your time. We don't want to have to stress you out with, um, obviously trying to record a podcast and moving into the house. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to take a little bit of a break. Maybe we're talking, picking back up uh, maybe after 4th of July. Uh, we've already got a, a few good guests. Uh, one, especially that I'm excited about that I've been meaning to have on. Again, if you heard me talk about um, Popcorn Digest um, before that inspired me to actually do this podcast, we've got uh, some special going on with them. Yeah, that sounds um, cool. Yeah, so we'll be able to chat with uh, a lot of, and hopefully a lot of other great guests like Molly, like Natasha, like Jason of Binge Movies and, and Kevin and David and Brian and, you know, all these people that we've had on this season and, and all the fun that we've had and all the conversations. Ruth probably will want to come back on again uh, oh. for our, yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll try to maybe rope her in. Maybe we'll actually get her to do the movie she wants to do this time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, be able to do that. But uh, just we're looking forward to more conversations. We're hoping you guys are really enjoying um, all the different voices and different perspectives we've been able to have and hopefully enjoy our format. So again, we're going to take a break um, just to rest up a little bit and kind of get settled. And then we'll be back in, in July. Uh, Johnny, any parting thoughts you wanted to give our listeners, watchers? Uh, have a good summer. All right, great. <laughs> That's good enough. Okay. So again, for Nostalgia Cast, I'm Darren Lumber. And I'm Johnny Craddock. And we'll see you next season, guys. Bye.